In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, what's worse for the planet, vegetarianism or carnivore? How to recover from a TBI or a concussion fast, the minimal effective dose of exercise from muscle, and much more. Health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and much more. My name is Ben Greenfield. Welcome to the show. Yo, yo, Jay. What's up? What's up? I'm back, baby. I like how we talk like gangsters. <laughs> I know, I know. I think when your voice goes lower, my voice goes lower. So yeah. next thing we know, we're going to sound like Thanos from Infinity War. Yeah, we're just middle-aged health enthusiasts trying to sound cool. How's right. life been, man? Life's been fast-paced, brother. I mean, yeah. there's a lot lot been going on since I've seen you last, actually. Yeah, I had to record my last Q&A podcast uh, without you podcast uh, 401 i have to admit i i might need your help today to keep this thing rolling i'm going on about eight hours of sleep for the past two days whoa uh, tell me tell me why what caused this mm, it's it's complicated but let me let me open up my my zevia here and and take a sip Oh, I thought it was going to be the Ascenza again because I've been drinking those things like crazy. With the Azen- oh, the Ascenza, the stuff from yeah. from Costco. That yeah, sparkling. well, I mean, yeah, when you can buy like thirty six of them or whatever, thirty eight of them for like ten ninety nine, it's it's a bit of a deal. Yeah, I still like Zevia better, but that stuff is pretty good. Um, I've been uh, immersed in a uh, plant medicine retreat for the past couple of days, which oh. means that I've I basically burnt through. Uh, as many neurotransmitters as I'd normally burn through in a week in a couple of days. And of course, when you do those things, you don't really sleep either. And as I think a lot of our listeners know, I, I in no way endorse people going out and doing, you know, 40 ayahuasca ceremonies in their lives to go find themselves. But at the same time, every once in a while, uh, very, very similar to uh, Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel's book, Stealing Fire, I will engage in what one might label as a relatively uh, not hedonistic but in- intensive immersion into mm-hmm. some some pretty pretty intensive and extreme plant medicine protocols. And uh, I was not at Burning Man, which actually happens to be going on right now. But I was yeah, I knew that was going on. Now it's kind of in my own my own little private version of Burning Man, all overseen by a medical professional, of course. But I'm a little bit I'm a little bit toasted. I will admit. I bet, so, man. Yeah. Well, I'll help you through it. So, do you, have you had a guide on this, like they're with you, or just someone that you can contact just in case shit hits the fan? No, I'm. I whenever I go as deep as I go in a real session, I have to have a medical professional around. You know, someone yeah. who, who knows CPR, et cetera. So, yeah, right. Uh, because these things can be pretty dangerous. Yeah, and it makes sense. I was wondering why you're putting off all these uh, crazy Instagram videos this week, and now I know why. <laughs> That's not why. <laughs> I literally, I I literally just got back like nine hours ago, slept a couple hours and, and here I am. So, uh, so anyways, that being said, that's why I might, might need a, a little, a little lift from, from my docky doc sidekick. And, uh, what do you think? Shall we jump into these news flashes? Let's jump into these, man. So everything you hear Jay and I talk about on today's show, we're going to put over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 402, where we keep some very comprehensive show notes for you all. Uh, But this is the part of the show where we go over some news flashes. And before I jump into uh, some of the things we're going to talk about regarding plants and animals and plant-based milks versus animal-based milks, uh, a few other things that I really want to dive into. Uh, the the first thing is this whole blue zone study that recently hit the fan. Uh, did you see this one, Jay? Yeah, I saw this, which kind of like threw me a little bit for a loop until until I started thinking a little bit more about it, and I can kind of give you my thoughts on this as we go. But yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so so the title of this study was a mouthful. It's a horrible title. Super centenarians and the oldest old are concentrated into regions with no birth certificates and short lifespans. Uh, essentially, what that means is that these reported you know blue zones or so called blue zones, as they name them in the abstract of the study, 
might have no credibility behind them because of very poor birth certificates and uh, anthropologic data that was collected. Uh, Mm -hmm. Areas of low incomes, low literacy, high crime rate, poor record keeping, relatively short life expectancy. When we're talking about places like Sardinia and Okinawa and Akaria. And so this hit the internet and a bunch of people basically reported that this whole blue zone thing is a scam because it comes from areas with very poor record keeping and poor birth certificate keeping. And, and, um, basically that's, that's it in a nutshell. That that's what this report was reporting. But when you look into it a little bit more deeply, there were some issues. So first of all, they they're reporting on these areas where there are so-called centenarians but the whole idea behind the blue zones was it it never claims to be reporting on regions with super centenarians and and blue zone areas are actually just places with the highest life expectancy where people can reach their 90s or so with low rates of chronic disease and where they have a high probability to reach 100 years old that that and and a super centenarian is technically someone who's living 110 years old plus right so the blue zones never actually claim to to be uh areas where you'd see you know folks living like methuselah as much as people living a pretty dang long time with relatively high health span so i think people just made the assumption that it was a, a place where people where there was the highest concentration of centenarians but i think it's a it's a valuable kind of piece of information to lay out there because i've seen so many people kind of talk about this online as say hey, this is a bunch of bs like we can take nothing from the blue zones and i know you're about to get into this here in a second but i think that's a completely wrong way to look at this study yeah and and when they actually wrote that book the blue zones and dan butner went and did all of his research on this, they actually traveled to this the, all these areas. They didn't do data crunching from afar. They actually visited each of these regions, you know, Sardinia and Okinawa and Loma Linda, et cetera, and they checked birth certificates, and they cross-referenced those with things like church baptism records and local records, and they were like boots on the ground in these regions. They weren't studying anthropologic data from sitting over here in a lab in the United States. So they actually mm-hmm. went over to each of these regions and they dove in to the civil registrars and they dove into the military registrars and they interviewed people and they they dug into actual birth certificates and verified survival status and verified things like rates of chronic disease. And all of this is reported on their website at, at bluezones.com and also in the book. So they actually did do some pretty good age verification in the Blue Zones research. And then the the other thing is that, you know, the the abstract of this controversial study that just came out reports relative poverty and short lifespan in these areas, but you you can't uh, synonymize poverty with with short lifespan because when you look at America and a lot of these westernized societies, people are going to die and they are dying from diseases of affluence like heart disease and cancer and diabetes. And in many cases, poor people are walking more than they're driving. They're in many cases eating more, you know, things like legumes and plants and vegetables from the garden, at least, especially in in poverty stricken areas that, that aren't westernized compared to like more processed foods and fast foods. Uh, they're spending more time connecting in their neighborhoods and forming relationships more than they are, say, you know, sitting in front of the television or staring at their phones. And so, you know, you, you again, can't just say because people are poor, they're not going to live long because it, it's often the case that, that poor people, you know, farmers and ranchers and hunters and gatherers, et cetera, they're, they're actually engaged in a lifestyle that allows them to live a longer time and have that good combination of health span and lifespan. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah no, I, to- I totally agree with that because I think that we have this notion, especially when we look at American-based studies, and we see kind of um, kind of this this correlation between poverty and and kind of poorer health outcomes. And while there are some truths to that, there's always trade-offs, like the ones that you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so once again, as we seem to visit over and over again on this podcast, don't look at a study headline and swallow hook, line, and sinker. So yeah, anyways. yeah, and and I. Yeah, I was going to say one last thing too is that, you know, I know that you've talked about this a lot is that 
even even let's say if all these data were correct and we could take it for the title of that that we see here there's still so many aspects that we can take from blue zones that we know from other science-based research studies are going to be effective like what you've mentioned here so it's it's like it's the idea of like we don't want to just take the title for what it is but we also have to kind of keep in mind that there are always things that we can take from these blue zones that uh, you know that 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 are kind of been out there, and so yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that I just I hate the idea of looking at a title and then just taking it for what it is. Yeah, I agree. All right, so now that we've kicked that horse to death. Uh, that, another really interesting study because I'm always always looking at natural alternatives to pharmaceuticals, and there's one very popular pharmaceutical for diabetes that's now being used as an off-label drug and anti-aging slash longevity protocol, and that's, of course, metformin. So uh, a, a really great researcher who actually has, has written some really good books and um, you know another, another good researcher that has some great uh, YouTube videos, TED Talks, and research out there on exercise and longevity, uh, the first being James D. Nicolantonio. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but you can look up some of his books. He's, he's got a, a great title that he co-wrote with Dr. Mercola about healthy fats probably find on Amazon. And then Dr. James O'Keefe, who did a lot of the research on kind of like how much exercise is good enough for endurance exercise and then how much is going to cause arterial stiffness or cardiovascular issues or heart arrhythmias, et cetera. Well, these two guys teamed up and recently put out a report in uh, the journal Open Heart about natural alternatives to metformin, basically a nutraceutical strategy that would replicate what metformin does for things like metabolic syndrome and cholesterol issues. So what they studied was uh, essentially a blend of astaxanthin, which is something that you get from, say, like krill oil. Uh, it's in the, the super essentials fish oil that I take. You can, you can buy it as a standalone supplement. And then they combine that with berberine and red yeast rice. What they found uh, when, when they looked into the research on these three compounds stacked was when it comes to things like mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, almost like a, a caloric restriction mimicking protocol, uh, this so-called you know exercise in a pill type of routine that that metformin seems to simulate as well. Uh, all of that was achieved with this combination of astaxanthin and berberine, and then when you add red yeast rice extract into the mix, it actually improved the metabolic profile when it came to lowering triglycerides and LDL cholesterol and increasing HDL cholesterol in a very similar manner as like a metformin statin combination. That's pretty and, incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah, extremely incredible. So, so. Uh, there are a lot of physicians now prescribing metformin or a lot of anti-aging enthusiasts taking metformin. And the problem with this uh, that I have a whole article about over on my website is that metformin can suppress your VO2 max. It can, based on recent research, uh, impair the mitochondrial response to exercise, thus reducing your fitness response if you're engaged in an exercise regimen. It can cause some issues that could be taken care of via supplementation like uh, B12 deficiencies, for example. It causes some pretty extreme gut discomfort in people. And it turns out that we can replicate that via natural methods in a very effective manner with things that don't seem to have the same type of impact, particularly astaxanthin, uh, berberine, and there are other things that act very similar to berberine, uh, like uh, bitter melon extract, like uh, uh, like organ grapefruit extract. But berberine is probably at the top of the list as far as a, a pretty effective strategy for this. Uh, and then this red yeast rice extract, which has some pretty favorable impacts on on metabolic profile, particularly on lipids. So I'll link to this study in the show notes, but you know we're not just talking about something that could improve metabolic syndrome, but also something that could be added to like an, an anti-aging or longevity stack. And in, indeed, when I talked to Dr. Sandra Kaufman, when I interviewed her on the podcast a few weeks ago, like astaxanthin, I think it was astaxanthin and NAD uh, were at the top of the list of natural supplements in her book about mm. longevity as far as things that hit almost every pathway of improving health span and lifespan simultaneously. 
So super so interesting. It's, it's, it was it was pretty cool to read this, and um, you know, again, people are out there taking metformin. I'm not a doctor. Don't misconstrue this as medical advice, but it turns out that that this would be a, a pretty cool herbal protocol to look into. I would I would totally agree. I think that it's super interesting that you can have the nutraceutical effects and not have the pharmaceutical side effects. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, Ben, is that I, I've I've done berberine, done astaxanthin, and I'm going to just say I don't I take those actually on a regular daily basis. But the red yeast uh, rice extract or red uh, is it red yeast right? Mm-hmm. What is it again? Yeah, R Y R. R Y R is that something that you get um, just like in powder form, encapsulated? I haven't even seen that. Yeah, I mean, you, you can you can buy it in a capsule, you can buy it in powder. I, I'm not necessarily convinced that that uh, modulating cholesterol in someone who does not have, say, familial hypercholesteremia or some pretty significant, say, like uh, high levels of of uh, particle counts, for example. I'm not convinced that red yeast rice extract is necessary and that lowering LDL cholesterol should be the holy grail for, you know, improving metabolic profile because there's not a lot of evidence that that in isolation is a true cardiovascular risk factor. But, you know, it, right. stacking astaxanthin and berberine appears to be a pretty cool combination for anti-aging. And then if you have lipid issues or if you have familial hypercholesteremia, et cetera, adding red yeast rice extract on top of that could also be a good strategy compared to say taking metformin and a statin. So, yeah, yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with that because I think with the RYR, I would be concerned with myself without a history of hypercholesterolemia, uh, hypercholesterolemia, oh out. geez. Yeah. Uh, with that <laughs> high cholesterol, <laughs> genetic form of high cholesterol, I would be afraid of lowering my LDL too much. Yeah. Um, and so, so I might just try the, the berberine and the astaxanthin combination. Yep. Cool. We'll, we'll link to that one in the show notes as well. And then here's a cool, cool study that came out for those of you who are into the whole minimal effective dose of exercise type of protocol. This was uh, uh, recently in the Journal of Strength Conditioning Research. And what they did was they compared high frequency weight training with low frequency weight training to see if there was any difference between the two when it came to increasing muscle mass and strength. And even more interestingly, they did this in trained individuals. A lot of these studies are done in untrained individuals who are going to respond to just about any exercise protocol. But this was done in trained individuals, in this case, men. And uh, what they did was they compared working out uh, at, at, a, at a low frequency versus working out at a high frequency. And I just realized, because I subscribed to this journal, it's 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 four feet away from me in my office. So I'm going to duck away from my microphone here and grab it so I can tell folks about it. Do it. Oh, I'm back. So uh, this study, let me let me see which page this was on. We're opening the kimono for those of you listening in as I scroll through this. Yeah, page 2,104. Here we go. Uh, So I want to tell you the exact protocol that they did because a lot of the news outlets that reported on this study, they didn't talk about the actual protocol. But the folks who were training at a low frequency, they were working out twice a week on a Monday and a Thursday. And what they were doing was kind of like a, a push protocol on a Monday and it was bench mm-hmm. press, dumbbell fly, cable triceps, uh, back squat, and leg extension. And then they were doing a pull routine on Thursday, lat pull down, straight arm pull down, bicep curl, and leg curl. Now, the group that was doing the high frequency, they were doing a push-pull protocol too, but they were pushing on Monday, pulling on Tuesday, pushing on Thursday, pulling on Friday. All right, so it was a Monday, Thursday right. push-pull protocol versus a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday push-pull protocol. What they, in a nutshell, found was that there was almost an identical improvement in both strength and muscle mass between the two groups, although, of course, the group that was training twice a week was spending twice as much time in the gym. So the the thing that I, I think people need to know about that they didn't do a very good job of reporting in the news was these were some pretty intensive weight training protocols. Both the the or not both the groups, but the the low frequency group, they were doing eight sets, like eight sets of bench press, eight sets That's of a flies, ton, eight man. sets of try. Yeah, they were doing Big a gas. lot of sets. And the group that was doing the lower 
or the, or the higher frequency protocol, they were only doing four sets, right? So we aren't talking about uh, a lower volume of training. We're talking about a lower frequency of training. So think right. of this as spending two hours in the gym on Monday and Thursday or spending one hour in the gym on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, yes, you can get the same results with low-frequency training as high-frequency training, but you need to understand that that low-frequency training is going to be twice as long, right? Right. So so it was it was a cool study. I mean, for people who, who are working hard and maybe have just two days a week with a longer period of time to be able to hit the gym, fine, go do it. But don't think that you can get away with, say, like the, the same – time length of training as you could with training more days of the week and i'm personally just from a from a pure metabolic blood sugar management movement standpoint i'm into moving more frequently lower volume than i am into just crushing myself a couple of times a week so i i still think that this this is not necessarily minimal effective dose of exercise as much as you know the same dose of exercise just compressed into a uh you know just a couple of days a week if that makes sense yeah, no, that makes total sense. I would just be worried on the low frequency days, doing that many sets all at once, that time frame. I'd just be worried about more proneness to injury uh, just because I would be so gassed doing 8 to 12 sets of, of bench press that I would be afraid that I'd just kind of overdo it and then end up injuring myself because I was trying to push too hard. Yeah, or just pissing Coca-Cola from Rabdo. That's the other issue. Like (laughs) you can do some serious muscle damage, but you know, ultimately let's just say that you are super busy and there's just like one or two days a week where you can hit the gym, just go crush it, you know, really hard for a really long time. And you could actually simulate the same effects as, as you know, if you hit the gym five times during the week. So interesting study, but once again, you know, don't swallow hook, line and sinker when you see the news headlines that say, Hey, training twice a week is just as good as training four times a week. So yeah, there's that. Now I also wanted to cover a few studies that came out really more articles than studies, but, but reports on this whole meat versus vegetable thing, both when it comes to milk, but also when it comes to greenhouse gases, when it comes to vegetarianism versus a carnivore diet. So I'll link to, to all of these articles in the show notes because they were all pretty interesting. But the first was about whether or not animal agriculture actually affects our climate as intensively as some would claim that it is because there's a lot of advocates that are urging folks to eat less meat to save the environment or even yeah. taxing meats to reduce the consumption of it to save the environment. Please now, don't. The, the issue here is that – uh, you know, one of the, the bad raps that meat gets is based on the assertion that livestock is the biggest source of greenhouse gases worldwide. And that's simply not true. There is often the comparison made to livestock versus transportation. And they'll say that, you know, livestock produces more greenhouse gases than do cars, for example. But it, it's kind of a misconception because when when you look at agriculture and uh, and you know and, and compare that to animal agriculture, uh, basically animal agriculture will produce about four percent of total greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And when you look at growing plants and the electricity, the transportation, and the industry necessary for agriculture versus animal agriculture it's actually closer to 9%. So we see yeah. almost double the amount of greenhouse gas emissions with with you know growth of crops versus growth of cattle. So that's that's one issue huh. is that you know so, some of the reporting is not that accurate. Well, people don't think about the production-related issues. You're right. I mean, the, the utilization of so many uh, production tools for for agriculture is just astronomical, and that's why it's going to upregulate kind of the, the amount of emissions that are produced. Yeah, and when you look at transportation's carbon footprint, they ignore impacts from manufacturing the vehicle material and parts. They ignore assembling vehicles and maintaining roads and bridges and airports. All they look at is the exhaust emitted by exactly. the cars, the trucks, the trains, and the planes, and not the greenhouse gas 
produced by the actual production of those. So yep. it, that that's another issue when you say like transportation it, uh, produces far less greenhouse gases than say like livestock productions. It's simply an, an inaccurate comparison. And and they delve into this in this article that I'll link to in the show notes. The the other issue is that a lot of people will say if we give up meat, we could save the climate. But there there's some issues with that as well. So if if all Americans eliminated all animal proteins from their diets, we would reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by about 2.5%. And uh -oh. it, it, it's really not that significant. And when, when you look at population growth worldwide and the projected need for meat and per capita meat consumption, that there's going to be a, a huge shortage of food if we decide to tax meat heavily or or somehow make meat production lower due to the potential for greenhouse gas emission. And, you know, I'll, I'll get into uh, shortly a, a different article that kind of goes into to grass-fed versus feedlot beef. But what's interesting is that meat is far more nutrient-dense per serving than any vegetarian or plant-based option. You know, all meat is far more nutrient-dense. So we can actually get, you know, uh, per whatever you want to call it, acre of, you know, grass-fed or grazing land, far more calories, far more nutrients to feed far more people than we can from plants, period. And, you know, Paul yeah. Saladino and I discussed this quite a bit, you know, when I, when I did kind of a carnivore podcast episode with him about th this idea that, you know, plant food is, you know, it, it's essentially poor food that requires far more land, far more acreage to grow enough nutrients and calories to feed as many people as the equivalent amount of livestock, especially if that livestock is raised in a manner that takes into consideration uh, the soil and the planet and you know a lot of other considerations that come to how we actually raise those animals, which gets into this other article that was actually, it appeared on NPR's website and it went into the difference between grass-fed beef and feedlot beef. And this was also really, really interesting because when you look at the environmental argument for grass-fed beef, you know, they, they actually do produce a little bit more methane, which incidentally, if, if you feed, you know, any, anything like a cow or a goat or a chicken, a little bit of seaweed along with their feed, you, you can actually reduce methane production significantly. The same thing can be said oh, really? for, for humans. You know, if you give humans activated charcoal or, or spirulina or chlorella, like the amount of, of uh, methanogenic bacteria activity decreases significantly, which is a good trick. If you're ever you know, hopping on a plane and concerned about <laughs> gas, you yeah. pop some activated charcoal, you take some spirulina or some chlorella, or you, know, you do that after you have a meal that's heavy in beans or cruciferous vegetables, and it can control that quite a bit, but can do so in, in, uh, in cattle or really you know, any animal as well. But um, yeah, it's interesting because even though a grass-fed uh, cow, for example, is going to produce more methane, the actual carbon that's sequestered uh, through through the process of things like you know like what the what the Savory Institute teaches, which is uh, you know rotating the areas where animals are grazing and using more sustainable agriculture practices and doing a lot of things that lower the environmental footprint. And then when you look at the fact that the grass fed beef is healthier, it's more concentrated in nutrients, etc., you actually see uh, lower carbon emissions overall. Uh, when you look at grass-fed versus feedlot beef, you see better landscape health, you see better soil health, and you see a, a much, much more favorable impact on the planet versus feedlot beef. So, you know, again, th this comes down to taking into consideration a lot more than just something like methane production or something like, you know, comparing the, the growth of plants to feeding cattle. You have to look at everything from the amount of transportation that's required. You have to look at, you know, what the actual impact on the planet is, etc. But it turns out that overall, when it comes to the health of the environment and when it comes to feeding more people, uh, and when it comes to carbon sequestration, am I saying that right? Sequestration? 
sequestration. Sounds about right to me. Let's yeah, go with it. I don't know. I'm just going to make up words. Uh, grass-fed livestock production is the way to go. And I think if, if everybody yeah. were to do something like, you know, grow a few of their own plants on a patio or a backyard or whatever, you know, raise a few chickens, buy grass-fed beef when they can get their hands on grass-fed beef, it'd be just far better for the planet and affect much, much greater change versus a combination of, of feedlot beef and or vegetarianism and, and large, large acreages uh, that are used for agricultural production. So, and there there are companies or, or organizations like the Savory Institute, for example, or you can look into, you know, any of the books or the work by Joel Salatin that make a, they take a much deeper dive into this. So, yeah. Yeah. Great points. I would say too, that I know a while back, uh, Rob Wolf wrote a, a kind of like, I guess a report on this. It might even have been a rebuttal to that movie. What the health and, uh, talked a lot about the information that you've listed here and, and discussed. So if anybody wants to Google his article, I'm sure it's flying around there, but I remember it just, it was a really potent one. And the other thing, Ben, little known fact actually is, did you know about 10 to 15% of greenhouse emissions are actually protein-based bodybuilding flatulence? What do you mean protein-based bodybuilding flatulence? I'm, I'm totally just kidding. I was uh, bodybuilding farts. Oh, bodybuilding farts. Oh, my gosh, dude. When I was a bodybuilder and I'd go to those shows, you'd step onto an elevator. It smelled like a bunch of animals died. <laughs> I mean, no, was, yeah, bodybuilding farts are, are it's horrible. It's so bad. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think I did some pretty significant impact to my gut back in the day when I was having you know four cans of tuna fish for dinner and five ABB bodybuilding yeah. whey protein shakes per day. I just... I can't even eat a whey protein bar or like smell a whey protein shake now without getting oh, yeah. gaseous. It's horrible. Yeah, it's so. no, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I, I used to take like about 75 to 100 grams of whey protein after workout and it was the worst thing in my I would have to go lay down in like the fetal position for an hour or two because I felt so bad. Yeah, if I ever went back and did bodybuilding again, I would basically do a largely ketogenic approach like high calorie mm -hmm. ketogenic approach with a little yeah. bit of a carb refeed, like a clean carb refeed in the evening. And then I just eat like 40 grams of either amino acids or collagen a day instead of whey protein. Yeah. And I oh, bet yeah. I could just get swole. Maybe I'll do that. Oh, someday. Yeah. Somebody just nah, needs man. to dare me. And then finally, plant-based milks versus animal-based milks. This one's interesting because a lot of people will drink uh, like soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, rice milk, etc., because they think they're better for the environment. But when you actually look at the nutritional value of these, they can be anywhere from 30 to 50% lower as far as the actual nutritional quality and the absorptability of the plant-based proteins compared to an animal protein. So you have, to, you have to sacrifice far more plants, use far more soil, uh, you know, Kill more small rodents as you're as you're you know growing all of these plants and agriculture based compounds to create the milk and getting far less nutrients per ounce when you're feeding these to people. So when when you take into consideration the greenhouse gas footprint of plant based milks like oat and almond and rice and soy versus animal based milk, animal based milk far and above is better for the environment and is far more nutrient dense. And I realize that a lot of people might be lactose intolerant or, you know, may, may just not do well with like a, like a cow based milk. And there are even, there, there are ways around that. Um, you know, for example, many, many people who can't process cow milk do just fine with goat milk or camel milk, or you know, yeah. people will snicker at this, but it's extremely nutrient dense. You know, water buffalo milk. Uh, you know, I personally still don't do that well that. with milk, and so I just consume uh, like any any form of dairy that I consume. I consume it either fermented or I do okay if it's raw because with a raw milk, a lot of the proteins are combined with the fat globules and less right. likely to uh, cross the, the blood gut barrier and, you know, wind up causing any type of autoimmune issues. So yeah. sometimes it depends on the, on the way that you consume the actual milk, whether it's fermented or whether it's raw, et cetera. But ultimately plant-based milks are not better for the environment. Once you consider the nutrient density 
and what you consider the damage to the environment from actually growing all the plants. So, yeah. you know, three different articles on plant-based milks versus animal-based milks on uh, feedlot cattle versus grass-fed cattle and on the environmental impact of animal agriculture versus uh, ver- versus you know something like a, a plant based agricultural approach. So you know these three articles I think were the best I've read recently on on this whole idea behind what's better for the environment. You know animals versus plants, and I really do think that animals are getting a much better rap than they deserve, especially like a natural grass fed sustainable approach to to raising animals for food. Agreed. Do you know how many almonds it takes? I mean, ju- do you just happen to know how many almonds it takes to make like a glass of almond milk? A shit ton, because my wife makes almond milk sometimes. Ah, uh, yeah. I figured it'd have to be a ton. Like, like do you ha- do you happen to know like weight wise? Is it like a pound of almonds in order to make like a glass of milk? Well, I just said a shit ton. So okay, I gotcha. Right. So is. yeah. I, well, I mean, I guess it's a ton. Yeah. I mean, I guess two thousand two thousand pounds of shit. So, uh, so yeah, anyways, those are the news flashes for this week. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 402 to check them out and get more. Well, 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 a few special announcements. Uh, first of all, my massive, uh, 600 page book that is a guide to everything, brain, body, and even spirit, like gratitude, sex, love, relationships. Uh, I cover a ton on mold, mycotoxin, lime, fixing the gut, building muscle, burning fat. This book is about three years worth of research and writing for me. And it finally hit Amazon for pre-order, even though it it doesn't come out until January. Uh, and also all these bonuses, uh, prizes, uh, you know, a bunch of sponsors have come on board for people who want to buy multiple copies, etc. This is a big, 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 if I can talk, big, bold, beautiful, hardcover, coffee table style book. I wanted to go big or go home on this one. Probably one of the, the most unique health books that you are ever going to get your hands on. If, if any of you read four hour body, for example, by Tim Ferriss, it's kind of like that, but, uh, but fully upgraded. And, uh, Ooh. that is all available. The book's called boundless, boundless, upgrade boundless. your brain, optimize your body and defy aging. The, the chapter on anti-aging alone is uh, over a hundred pages long. So, I mean, it's got Dang, dude. In there. like peptides, t- SARMs, stem cells. I mean, like I cover everything and it's the most cutting edge shit that uh that i've been able to discover over the past three years so yeah. uh that's Dude, at boundlessbook.com boundlessbook.com if anybody wants to get in on the pre-order or find it when the book comes out you can also just go to amazon and search for boundless ben greenfield and you'll find it so i'm excited nice to man announce Dude, that. is it uh is it all loose leaf or did you actually end up bounding the book oh yeah it's bound yeah. Okay, I it's didn't know if you were going book. like full hardcore with this boundless type yeah. thing. It's as many pages as we could we could get with binding it, and then even though the original manuscript is over a thousand pages long, uh, what we've done is given access within the book to anything that we cut from the book because it wouldn't fit. So I have tons of extra exercise plans, nutrition plans, nice. research, everything available on the book website. And anybody who gets the book will get access to all of that. So nice. boundlessbook.com. Nice. Uh, Send it over my way. Signed copy. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> this, uh, this podcast is of course brought to you by Keon. We've been up to a whole bunch of stuff over at Keon and, and we're working on a bunch of different formulas for you guys behind the scenes. But right now, anybody who's listening to this podcast can get 10% off site wide at Keon. You go to getkeon.com and uh, we have amazing ebooks over there now. We have a brand new uh, meditation ebook you can get for less than 10 bucks. We have, of course, our coffee, our amazing chocolatey, coconutty goodness mouthful mm, of the so Keon good. Clean Energy Bar. We've got our, our lean fat loss supplement. We've got our flex uh, joint fixing supplement. Everything's over there. So get Keon.com and the code you can use as a podcast listener is BGF10. That saves you 10% site wide. 
Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by a new supplement from my friends at Organifi. So what they did was they uh, put together this new collagen formula, but they threw in hyaluronic acid and a special mushroom called tremella mushroom, which helps to hydrate the skin. And then they put a plant-based bamboo silica, which has been shown to support collagen production. And basically what this thing does is it increases the amount of collagen that you get, but it is specifically designed as almost like something you eat for your skin. So it smooths fine hmm. lines and wrinkles. It repairs your skin. It protects against sun damage. So it's perfect for these summer days. And it tastes really good. It's raspberry lemon flavored. You, you mix it in water like any of the Organifi powders. You save a ton of money compared to going to the cold press juicery, and the stuff just tastes fantastic. You can consume it on an empty stomach with a meal; doesn't matter. And um, everybody listening gets twenty percent off of that one. So that's called Organifi Glow. Organifi nice. Glow. So you go to Organifi dot com slash Ben. Organifi with an I. Organifi dot com slash Ben, and you use code Ben G two zero to get twenty percent off of anything from Organifi. Uh, and, and if anybody hadn't listened to it yet, if you have not listened to the Drew Cannoli uh, podcast, you really should. It was a good one, dude. Yeah, I, ju- I just interviewed Drew, and, the, and uh, you can go find that at bengreenfieldfitness.com. Just search for Drew Cannoli. Good guy. Um, this podcast is also brought to you by Clear Light. Clear Light Infrared Saunas, same sauna I own that I can have a bunch of buddies over and sit in there. I can fit four or five. I've had six people in there before, my Clear Light Sanctuary Sauna. They make small saunas, they make big saunas, but this is a full-on infrared sauna that does not microwave you like a lot of these high EMF saunas do. So don't just go out and buy your bargain bin infrared sauna because a lot of them, even though you get your sweat on and you detox like you do in any infrared sauna, they just basically bombard you with dirty electricity. Clear light sauna. Frying your cells. Yeah, clear light sauna doesn't do that. Uh, you get all the anti-aging benefits that they showed in the in the Finnish uh, men's aging study, the decrease in risk of diabetes, decrease in risk of Alzheimer's. These things come with a lifetime warranty, and any of my listeners get a $500 off discount at HealWithHeat.com if you use code Ben Greenfield at HealWithHeat.com. Uh, and that's that's a clear light. The one that I have is the Sanctuary. It's the one in my basement. And they're coming out with this fancy new like salt water infusion thing that you can put in there that I'm getting installed this week. Where you can like oh man breathe water like you do in these lung healing salt mines. But they've added that oh, to their clear light. So all that's sorts badass. of goodies. So if you want to breathe yeah. salt and get sweaty with five other men or yeah. women, whatever, you floats mm. your boat. Yeah, clear light. Yeah, that's what I'm into. So uh, then finally, our last sponsor for today's show is NetSuite. So NetSuite, uh, what they do is they produce a business management software, but it does everything for you with one piece of software. So it's all in a cloud platform. They have everything put together for accounting, for sales, for inventory, and rather than having a different software program for each, which is this big, inefficient mess, NetSuite just combines it all together. So uh, you save time, you save money, you save unneeded headaches. They manage sales, finance, accounting, orders, HR, everything. You can even do it all from your phone. It also comes with a desktop, and it is the world's number one ranked cloud business system. So they're giving all of my listeners a free guide. If you go to netsuite.com slash Ben, and the guide is called Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, netsuite.com slash Ben. You can go there, download your free guide, and get access to NetSuite, which is an amazing way to run your business without having a hodgepodge of business systems. So check that one yeah, out. Get rid of and, that hodgepodge. Uh, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's about it for our special announcements, unless you have anything mm. to share, Jay. No, I think you covered it for the both of us. Yay. All right. Let's go jump into these questions. Let's do it. Hey, Ben. This is Kevin calling from uh, San Rafael, California. I, like you, also like to eat a lot of uh, tendons, uh, cartilage, bone marrow, stuff like that. I'm wondering if that's as an effective uh, way of getting the nutrients as doing a uh, 
uh, a bone broth, say uh, pressure cooking the same bones for two, three hours and uh, drinking the broth from there. Um, thanks a lot. Appreciate your, your expertise and response. Well, Jay, I don't know if I ever told you this. I think I may have mentioned on a podcast before, but uh, occasionally like I'll make a beer can chicken out on the Traeger grill where I literally just like shove a beer can up the butt of a chicken after I've emptied about half the beer out, poked a few holes Dude, in the top. Like- that's oh, like what you see down in my in my country. The southern southern oh, lions do so that. So good. You get like such good, and you can you don't have to use beer. You could yeah. use you know you, I don't know if you could use Zevia soda whatever. But it's the moisture <laughs> that comes out of the can that really gives it the flavor. I've never done right. it with anything except beer. Uh, but anyway, so I'll make that, or my wife will occasionally like make a roast chicken. We always take mm-hmm. the carcass right after we've eaten it, and we make bone broth out of that. But what I'll do is I'll take all of the the bones after we've made the bone broth, and I mm-hmm. save them because those bones are so moist, and you can almost chew through the entire bone. You can suck the marrow out. I'll right. save the bones and cook them up in a cast iron skillet with a little bit of olive oil, and I'll throw some some pepper or some turmeric or some sea salt on there. You know, drizzle a little bit of like primal kitchen dressing on there, and it's like I will literally mm. eat a pile of bones for lunch sometimes. Oh, now, I thought you were going to say you did it for dessert. I was like, that sounds like no. some great dessert after you're done eating your roast chicken. No, I have not yet made bone ice cream, but. <sighs> But bones themselves, they're highly nutritious. I annoy people at restaurants sometimes because, like, I'll go out to a you know, like a bistro and get one of those Mary's organic chickens, and I'll sit there and yeah. eat it. But I actually gnaw that like the knuckles off the ends of each bone and suck the marrow out. And like, I I absolutely love bones. Like, I, well, once yeah. you get used to it and you kind of get past the fact that you know people look at you funny when you're you know holding a bone and eating it like finger food. Like it's it's a great way to eat, and it results in less food waste because you're getting every last bit of of nutrition out of that animal. But but bones mm. are they they have collagen. That's the main thing. When when you cook the collagen, it turns into gelatin, uh, which is a really great source of amino acids, the building blocks of protein. And then the bone marrow itself is very high in iron and vitamin A and K, fatty acids, selenium, zinc, manganese. And when you add other ingredients to a bone broth, you know, like vegetables, for example, you add additional nutrients that just ferment in that stock pot along with the water. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to just mainline nutrients into your body. It's like drinking vitamins. But you can get a oh, yeah. lot of that from just chewing the knuckles and sucking the marrow out of the bones. Now, right. they've, they've shown that this gelatin can break down into collagen in the body. And there are studies that show that gelatin supplementation directly increases the amount of collagen in tissues. So it's wonderful for the joints, especially for athletes. There was another study in the Journal of Nutrition that actually looked at the collagen from the connective tissue of chickens and showed a significant improvement in knee joint pain, uh, especially in people with osteoarthritis. So it it has uh, kind of a healing effect as well on the joints, or at least an anti-pain effect. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was a study on on glutamine, which is an amino acid in very high concentrations in bone broth, and they found that it helped to heal the intestinal barrier in both human and animal models. And people with inflammatory bowel disease were also shown to be able to get a lot of benefits out of glutamine. Now, some people will have bone broth prior to sleep. There was another study that the glycine that you're going to find in bone broth uh, helps to improve deep sleep levels. So this could be another strategy if your deep sleep scores, if you're measuring that with something like an, like an aura ring, for example, a cup of bone broth with dinner or you know, chewing a little bit of the knuckles off that bone of chicken when you're, when you're having roast chicken for dinner, you're getting access to the glycine, which can help with sleep. Uh, Does bone, wonders for the sleep. Yeah, very high in protein uh, while being relatively low in calories. You know, when I drink bone broth, because I, what I do is if my wife hasn't made bone broth during the week, I drink a carton of that kettle and fire stuff. And I've actually... This is so good. My wife has been making bone broth lately, so I drink a whole carton of kettle and fire, which is actually... They, they're one of the few companies 
that combines marrow bones with organic mm-hmm. vegetables, and then they filter it through steel kettles. They slow simmer it for 24 hours, so you get a ton of nutrients and collagen and amino acids soaking into the broth, and then they, they ship it to your house, and just drinking one carton of this stuff, and it's extremely shelf-stable. Uh, yeah, it, it you is. can You can almost feel it in your gut as soon as you drink it. So not oh, to turn this so. into a, you know, an advertisement for kettle and fire, but... <laughs> But I drink a lot of bone broth, and I swear, like it helps with sleep, it helps with joints, a ton of benefits. Yeah. But I also chew bones, so I'm getting right. getting the best of both worlds. Now, there's one interesting study that appeared in the Journal of Cell Metabolism that shows that there's actually an effect on the endocrine system too. Uh, the bone marrow that you're going to find in bone broth, or when you like chew into a bone and suck the marrow out, or, or you know order bone marrow at a restaurant that comes out of the femur bone of the animal. That actually helps you to produce something called adiponectin. It's a significant source of the hormone, adiponectin, and that helps to maintain insulin sensitivity. It helps to break down fat. It's been linked to decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, and obesity-associated cancers. So there's there's actually a very interesting effect on the endocrine system that relatively new research has shown that you're going to get from particularly the marrow in bone. It's called bone marrow adiponectin. Adipose tissue, and that's a source of adiponectin, which is something that helps out a lot of humans from an endocrine function and uh, a metabolic stabilization standpoint. So that's another benefit to either chewing the bones or or sucking the marrow out of the bones. So right. so yeah, I mean you're you're getting a ton of benefits out of chewing, but you're not getting the enormous concentrations of collagen, gelatin, amino acids, some of the extra nutrients you'll get from the vegetables if you're throwing vegetables into the bone broth. Uh, You aren't getting the hydrating effect of the bone broth itself when you're just eating the bones versus making the bone broth. So in my opinion, you get the best of both worlds, right? You make your your, your chicken or whatever. You eat whatever of the bones you can. You make bone broth after that to get even more of the goodness from the bones. And, um, you know, then you, you cook up what's left over in a cast iron skillet like I do and actually eat the rest of the bones and you're going to get a ton of benefits. But yeah, I mean, like I, I chew bones all the time. I dig them. I Mm -hmm. get strange looks, but man, I'm like, I'm, I'm super into bones. Strange looks are well worth it. When you do kettle and fire, do you uh, order the chicken broth or do you do like a beef broth? I get uh, half chicken, half beef. So I just order the cool. boxes and I get one box of chicken, one box of beef. And they, they like they have a whole bunch of different flavors like turmeric ginger and mushroom chicken and coconut curry. They're doing soups now. They've got like keto soup. So I'll put I'll put a link to, to Kel and Fire in the show notes. People are too lazy to make bone broth. But yeah, yeah. eat the bones. Yeah. They're good. Go uh, eat the bones, drink the broth. You know, I I at first had like such a repulsion to like eating tendons, cartilage, sucking out bone marrow, but now it's just it's one of my favorite things. And I hated bone broth the first time I tried it. I was a, I was a little bit of a baby about it, and I could only do chicken. I could not do beef, but now I actually prefer beef. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so yes, yes on the bone broth. Hey Ben. After being introduced to a low-carb, high-fat diet and intermittent fasting several years ago, I found it quite easy to maintain an ideal body weight between 160 and 170 pounds. Most of my body is pretty lean, but when I measure my stomach fat using a caliper, I come in around 15%. I've always heard that belly fat is one of the last places men lose fat, but I'd rather not drop to 145 pounds just to see abs. There seems to be a community of people online who believe you can spot reduce fat. Do you think that's possible? And if so, what techniques would you recommend? Thanks. So can you spot reduce? This one's interesting because they actually did a study on this. Like if you could exercise one body part and actually lose fat in that one body part. So they had like Mm -hmm. one group train uh, one leg using the leg press exercise And they did this for 12 weeks, three times per week. They were just doing leg press exercise with one leg. And it's like that movie lady in the water. Have you ever seen that one where the guy only uh works out one arm? So he's jacked on like one side and got a baby little skinny arm on the other. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. No, it sounds pretty effed up. It was. Yeah. No, I never trained like that. I I'm, I'm almost like, uh, OCD when I train, like if one muscle doesn't feel like it's getting as exhausted as the other muscle, 
you know, I, I uh, for example, I use like those blood blood flow restriction bands sometimes when I train. And if one just feels like slightly yeah. tighter than the other, I'll mess around with them and make them just perfect. Like if like I I'm totally symmetrical with all my training. <laughs> Such a neurotic perfection. I'm very neurotic. I, I rank very high on the perfectionist score on my my enneagram evaluation. No, uh, me too. Anyways, though, the these folks are doing like. 900 to 1200 repetitions of the leg press exercise with just that one leg in a training session. So we're talking about very high rep with the leg press exercise with just one leg. And despite that enormous number of repetitions, that one leg they were training didn't lose any more fat at all than the leg that wasn't exercising. Now the people were losing fat, but the fat was actually coming from their trunk and their arms, not their leg. So long were they not losing more fat in one leg than the other, but the fat was coming from somewhere completely different. That, t- that study was called Regional Fat Changes Induced by Localized Muscle Endurance Resistance Training. So essentially, huh. the, the fancy scientific name for spot reduction is regional fat changes, and they didn't yeah. see anything in this study. So I would not have predicted that. Yeah, the reason for that is... You know, when when you exercise, especially if you're exercising to reduce fat, your body tends to mobilize fat from different regions. You know, particularly it'll use the fat around the waistline quite significantly, but it's it, it's not going to spot reduce in one specific area if you're using just an exercise strategy. Now that mm-hmm. being said, there are a lot of newer kind of like medical methods that can spot reduce. And I didn't have time before this podcast, and, and I felt bad because I know for a fact that I tweeted this out. Uh, I, I I forget where I tweeted it out. I couldn't find the tweet, but I had found a research study recently that looked into a form of electrical muscle stimulation. Um, I'm trying mm. to remember what it was. It, or no, it wasn't electrical muscle stimulation. It was hyperthermia, right? Like localized heat treatment. It was yeah. uh, pulsed shortwave diathermy. Pulsed shortwave diathermy. I think I'm it's remembering mouthful. that correctly. And uh, what they found was that with pulsed shortwave diathermy, they could actually get a little bit of a spot reduction effect. And this was like a localized heat treatment. And very similarly, mm. they've also shown with this cool sculpting, which is like an FDA cleared, they call it cryolipolysis, that that yeah. actually can destroy fat cells in a localized area. It's expensive. It's like 750 bucks per treatment. Uh, but I know. It, it is crazy expensive. And doesn't like a plastic surgeon have to perform that procedure? Yeah, I think so. It has to be. Yeah. You can't just buy one of these for your house. There's another one called Zorona, which is an FDA cleared cold laser technology and very similar to cool sculpting, this can actually cause localized fat loss. Now, I suspect, even though I haven't tried this and I haven't found any studies on it, that some of these things like the uh, like the cool fat burner vest or the or the yeah. cool gut burner device that, that you wear around your waist that you pack cold into, I suspect you could probably spot reduce with any of those if you were to apply them in localized areas, like wrap the cool gut burner around your, your thigh instead of your abs, mm-hmm. for example. But I haven't seen any studies and I haven't tried that myself. But based on the fact that cool sculpting and this Zorona cold laser technology can both burn fat in localized areas or, or cause fat reduction or lipolysis in localized areas, I suspect you could probably kind of like hack something like that together at home with just like a cold treatment as long as you could do it without burning the skin, which I think would be the biggest, right. biggest risk. There's another one called Sculp Shore that you could look up, S-C-U-L-P Shore, and that's also an FDA cleared device that is used almost like a hyperthermic laser. So this one would again be like a heat based treatment. And a lot of these take a while. We're talking like six to 12 weeks to get the full effect. I question whether you might just be able to get the same thing through full body exercise you know, oh, yeah. and, you know, go, go at it that way. You know, Hell like, of a lot cheaper. Oh yeah. Yeah. Versus, versus, you know, spot reduction. So that's another thing that you could look into, um, you know, liposuction and thigh lifts and things like that. You know, again, like using surgery, I'm not a huge fan of. There's also something that's called Ultra Shape, and that's an FDA approved ultrasound technology, and that's used to treat fat on the hips or the thighs or the the upper arms or the belly, and that also has been shown to be effective for diet reduction or, or, or I'm sorry for uh, for spot reduction. But stepping back and looking at this big picture, I think a lot of people are just 
psychologically in the wrong place if they're going after spot reduction in a specific area. Like you were mm-hmm. built a specific way. There are a variety of different body shapes. Some people are going to have bigger calves. Some people are, as they age, are, are going to develop more fat in the thighs or around the waist or in the upper neck. And I mean, yeah, you, I, I think everybody should be physically active, should exercise, should have some amount of caloric restriction or periods of intermittent fasting and should just move functionally throughout the day with some amount of attention paid to how much food they're stuffing into their gaping maw. And then at that (laughs) point, just let your body be the best body it's going to be based on your genetics and whatever you inherited from your parents, rather than trying to have the thighs that your next door neighbor has, or, you know, have the calves that your favorite celebrity or athlete has, or, you know, the abs of Ben Greenfield waistline that you crave. Yeah. Like I have a tiny waist. I just do like I have a tiny waist and big shoulders the way I was built and uh, you know, and and I'm pretty happy about that, but I also have pretty skinny calves. Right. And sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see somebody walking around just like rippling calves. I'll be like, man, I wish I wish I would have had those calves when I was bodybuilding or, you know, I wish I had (laughs) the vert that that person probably gets from their calves, but you know what? That's the wrong way to think. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go get calf implants in the same way that I don't think somebody who's got like big old thunder thighs should go after some kind of a spot reduction protocol for their thighs. That's how you were built, right? Great. Right. You can squat more. You can leg press more. You probably have a very strong foundation if you're going to play football or, you know, engage in a sport where you need to have stronger legs. So, I mean, j- just don't have that grass is always greener syndrome and be happy with with the way that your body is built to a certain extent like i even though i'm telling you about some of these you know medical protocols you can use like cool sculpting and zerona and ultra shape etc i mean think about how many people in your local community you could feed by taking those four thousand dollars you're going to spend on 12 weeks of cool sculpting to fix that little bit of fat in your thighs that annoys you yeah and just be happy with your body and go move, go physically exercise, you know, restrict calories to a certain extent, live healthy, and then let your body be the body that <laughs> God gave you, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think one thing too, Ben, that I was thinking about as we were talking about this is that I'll have a lot of patients who come to me in clinic and they're, you know, not, not happy with kind of the shape they're in and they're kind of interested in, let's say gastric bypass surgery. They're interested in kind of these, these quick fix weight loss kind of mechanisms without kind of engaging in behavioral change. And so some people will go out and do cool scope sculpting, do kind of all these things that cost a lot of money and don't require a ton of time and effort necessarily. Necessarily. And then, yes, it works for a little bit of time, but because behavioral change wasn't made or because, too, their motivation is just so way off in this aspect, they end up either just gaining the weight back or they don't feel really good about what they did. And so I think you speak to kind of just kind of a key component of what it is to be human, which is kind of looking at what is our motivation for doing this? Are we doing this because, yes, we want to see our abs and look like you know, the centerfold model, or are we doing this because we truly care about our health and our well being and we want to feel as optimally as we can? So it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Yeah. And and one interesting thing just just for people who are interested in like physiology and performance is that you can glycogen deplete in specific areas. And this is something, for example, that uh, like a like I know that the Tour de France cyclists will do this sometimes, is you can exercise a specific muscle and glycogen deplete that muscle and then reload it at the end of the exercise to cause specific growth in that muscle area. So for example, like you can go on, let's say you want to build your legs, but not your upper body or some, or, you know, build your upper body, but not your legs. You can actually go and do an exhaustive exercise protocol for the upper body or an exhaustive exercise protocol for the lower body in a fasted state or in a low carbohydrate state. And then after that exercise protocol, reload on carbohydrates and you'll get muscle growth in that specific area that you worked. And that's an interesting, you know, for people who want like a bigger upper body and a smaller lower body, or they feel like they're, you know, like their legs are bigger than their upper body or their upper body is bigger than their legs. You actually just train in a low carb state, then refuel with a high carb post-workout feed. And you can actually get muscle growth in that specific area. while the area that you didn't train doesn't get the muscle growth. So that is something that actually has been looked at in physiology and is kind of a cool little trick for people who do want to tweak their 
tweak their physiology. It's not, you know, spot reduction per se as muscle as much as like, uh, you know, like muscle spot growth, but that's kind of a yep. cool strategy too. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. What do you think? One more question. Let's do one more. Hi, Ben. Mark here. Longtime listener, amateur biohacker. Uh, a good friend of mine just got in a really serious car accident, and she's been told she has some minor brain damage that's going to be permanent and some spinal injuries. And I was thinking back to some interviews you've had with Rhonda Patrick and some other experts, and I knew there was some nutritional advice that you gave regarding brain injuries, but I've only been able to find some of them. Could you give a brief summary of what you would advise for a recovery program nutritionally? Thanks so much, man. Bye. Man, oh man, oh man. I have a I have a lot for this. I have a lot for the TBI mm-hmm. concussion issue because um frankly, again, even though I'm not a doc, don't misconstrue this as medical advice. I do I do a lot of consults and a lot of coaching and a lot of personal work with people who have had head injuries, TBIs, mm-hmm. concussions, and um it's a passion of mine. Like I, I really like to help people with this issue or at least connect them with solutions. And yeah. um and, and I have a lot of them. And, I, and I, I've, I've done interviews uh, in many cases with people who, who have put out really good books and have really good information on kind of a multimodal approach to TBI and concussion issues. Like Dr. Dan Engel is one. He wrote the Concussion Repair Manual. And that's a very comprehensive manual when it comes to pulling out all the stops, you know, from – plant medicine to, to hyperbaric therapy for managing, you know, TBI and concussion issues. And, uh, you know, that one's called the concussion repair manual. I have also interviewed a couple of guys in New York city, uh, who have some really good protocol protocols for concussion. Um, I'll, what I'll do is, is I'll just collect all the podcasts I've ever done on concussions and TBI. Probably the two, the two areas that I've done the most amount of podcasts on when it comes to medical issues is cancer and concussions. Um, hmm. for some reason, I, I think it's just because I, I'm personally interested in both of those, but I've, I've had a lot of interviews on both of those issues. So I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. But, um, recently I had a friend who had a pretty significant concussion. Uh, he was actually doing, uh, uh, like a Wim Hof breathwork protocol and passed out, fainted. Oh, I mean, really? Which is why you should always be like laying on your back or sitting cross-legged and never underwater if you're doing Wim Hof breath training. But. Yeah. Yeah, he got a pretty significant concussion, and I was actually at his house a couple of days after he got it, and you know we were talking about this, and he eventually you know wrote wrote over to me because he he's a really smart, intelligent, connected guy, and he put together uh, you know he talked to a ton of different physicians and doctors, and you know visited with me for a while, and, and put together a very comprehensive multimodal protocol that I think was really good, and you know I I, I took notes on that, and I, I collected a bunch of other mm-hmm. protocols that I've looked at, and I'm gonna. I'm going to walk Mark and the rest of the listeners through exactly what I would do if I wanted to pull out all the stops to repair my brain as fast as possible. And interestingly, many of these tactics are the same ones that could be used to stave off dementia or or Alzheimer's or to Mm -hmm. just enhance cognition in general. Nice. Um, Give it to him, man. So here we go. Uh, and, and I'm going to put this full list over in the show notes to at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 402. So first of all, you want a little bit of like sensory deprivation. Uh, so a lot of sleep and doing nothing in a dark room, like no TV, no reading, no typing, just being in a dark room or with a full darkness eye mask, like a mind fold. And you just basically cut yourself off from high amount of sensory and neurotransmitter stimulation. When you are mm-hmm. out and about, you use blue light blocking glasses like you know orange tinted or red tinted glasses or sunglasses. And you're essentially just blocking out light and stimulation as much as possible. The same thing with sound. As much as possible, use noise blocking headphones, use earplugs, uh, limit your, your access to music, to MP3s, to podcasts podcast to emails to technology you essentially just want to cut yourself off from stimulus and i would do this for a good two to three days after the concussion so you're not Mm -hmm. overstimulating your brain uh blue light blocking uh especially on monitors and on your phone i would put blue light blocking software like flux on the phone i would put iris which is a really good blue light blocking software on all the monitors yeah, and so that good. also can really help and I, I do that anyways and you know all my clients number one I, I help out with just general sleep issues etc we all do that you know the blue light blocking technology Oh yeah. Vagus nerve stimulation. Uh that that can help out quite a bit with settling down some of the some of the nerve issues that happen from a concussion.
compression or a TBI. So there's the mm-hmm. new Calm device. There's also the uh, Circadia device made by Fisher Wallace. Uh, both of those forms of vagus nerve stimulation can be very effective. So I'd get a vagal nerve stimulator uh, and use that. I would also use what's called low level. I think it's LLLT. It's 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 low, low level, level light therapy. therapy. Low level light therapy. Yeah, I think it used to be laser, but then it's turned yeah. to light now because most yeah. of them are LEDs. I don't know. I'm sleep deprived. I'm useless. <laughs> uh, I got your back, buddy. Uh, thank you. But uh, the Violight. So Violight makes two devices. One called an Alpha. One called a Gamma. It's a combination mm-hmm. of intranasal and cranial uh, light stimulation. And uh, I own one. I, I did that this morning, actually, because I was so sleep deprived and felt like I had a lot of neural inflammation. So their gamma device is more powerful. It's the one that has more research on it for things like dementia and Alzheimer's and brain inflammation. So I think the gamma is a little bit better. Uh, that's a 40, Dude, they have a, 40 hertz stimulus. They have a dual one. Yeah. Now. Oh, they, oh, they have two. Yeah, well, they actually have a dual one where you can oh. get it, and it has both alpha and gamma built in. It's like another five hundred bucks. So wow. instead of like you know paying whatever it is fifteen hundred dollars for two of them, it's just an extra five hundred dollars, and you Sick. get both gamma and alpha now. Cool, cool. I yeah. dig it. All right, so so uh, low level light therapy, the Violite is the device that I like for that. Uh, if you have access to a float tank or sensory deprivation chamber, using that daily, you know, in addition to just like blocking yourself off from the world for a few days, that daily float tank use can be very effective as well. Really good research behind float tank use and sensory deprivation and management of TBI concussions. So uh, that's something you can look up in your local community in addition to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, that, that one is incredibly effective doing hyperbaric mm-hmm. oxygen therapy chamber, 30 to 40 sessions is typically what it takes. So we're talking about like daily in that thing for an hour mm-hmm. to an hour and a half. But if you can hunt one down, some companies will sell them that, like portable ones that you can use for your house. But HBOT, uh, it, it, that's very, very healing for the brain, it's healing for the body as well, tissue injuries, et cetera. But I would definitely look up HBOT also. Um, full on ketosis, definitely a strict ketotic diet for at least four weeks after the injury has occurred. Um, and that would include the use of ketone esters or ketone salts, like supplementing with ketone esters or ketone salts. In addition to a full ketogenic diet, that would be a, a non-negotiable for me if I ever had a would TBI. You, would you just go straight issue. carnivore then? No, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily eliminate plants. I think that there are some benefits to the antioxidants and the phytonutrients that you're going to get from a plant-based protocol. Um, but it, it would be a plant rich ketogenic diet. I would not go full carnivore because I've seen agreed. more evidence that a plant rich ketogenic diet is good for the brain, TBI, concussion, neural inflammation compared to a carnivore diet. And agreed. I just think it's going to be, it's going to be better. As a matter of fact, I'll link to it in the show notes, but, uh, my buddy actually developed this comprehensive brain enhancing shake. Uh, and it's just like, it's a ton of different like mushrooms. Uh, some of the alkaloids oh, yeah. and mushrooms can be very healing for the brain. Uh, some different probiotics, spirulina, chlorella, some different greens, sprouts, etc. Kind of like a, well, I mean, as the name implies a brain shake. So yeah. uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that full thing in the show notes, but it, it's, it's really just designed for neural inflammation to heal the brain and it does have plants in it. So, uh, so yeah. And, and he was, he was having that daily, I believe uh, a couple mm-hmm. of other things when it comes to, you know, more fringe things. And I realize some of these things are more expensive. You don't have to do them all, but again, like if you just wanted to pull out all the stops is what I would do. I would do a short course of HGH or like an HGH precursor, like ipamorelin or tessamorelin or just straight up HGH, just like a one to two week max course of that. You don't want to overuse something like that, but at the same time, that can assist greatly with healing. So getting your hands on a, on a growth hormone peptide or just straight growth hormone itself, that'd be another thing. That'd be an injectable. There are also peptides that you can use. Uh, specifically, there, there's a peptide stack that I actually use this sometimes. I did some of it this morning. Uh, but uh, there are five different peptides that are incredible for neural inflammation. Uh, some are topical, some are injectable, and some are intranasal. So the intranasal one is called CMAX. It's also known as cerebral lysine. You could go to peptidesociety.org to look up a doctor in your local community who can prescribe any of these. Uh, dihexa, which is like a topical peptide that you apply to either side of your neck, right around the carotid artery. Uh, two other peptides for the brain, cortigen and pinealin, which would be uh, injections into the abdominal area. 
and then BPC-157, which is also like a neural anti-inflammatory that would be a straight-up injectable into the abdominal area. So peptides would be another one that I would consider. Um, in addition to the peptides and the growth hormone, there's also a lot of evidence now that using stem cells, either V-cells or exosomes or umbilical or amniotic stem cells that you snort, like, like intranasal stem cells, uh, in addition to intranasal CMAX that just goes straight into the brain and can help a ton with concussion, TBI issues, neural inflammation, et cetera. And again, a lot of this stuff can just be used as, as general cognition enhancing strategy. So a um, few other things I would consider uh, in terms of uh, neurogenesis, there is a lot of evidence that psilocybin and that cannabis and that lion's mane, especially if all three are stacked together, this would be something you could do prior to the float tank. Uh, the, those can all be effective and safe treatments for head trauma, for concussions, for enhancing the, the regrowth and the healing of neurons. So we're talking about like a microdose of psilocybin combined with lion's mane, combined with a little bit of cannabis. That also can be an effective treatment. So I'll look into that also. I know a lot of this stuff flies under the radar, uh, but, but it comes mm -hmm. down to a lot more than just like, you know, rest, for example. Right. Um, cold thermogenesis like cold water head dips uh, or just like full-on cold shower, cold bath, that can enhance a little bit with uh, cardiovascular flow, with capillarization, uh, with healing of the blood-brain barrier, so some element of cold thermogenesis as well. Uh, there, there are a few other things that, that my buddy did that I will put into the show notes. But the, the other main thing that I wanted to point out to folks was that there are some, some really good clinics now that are popping up that do a really good job with the brain. Um, Dr. Dan Engel's clinic in Boulder, Colorado, he does a lot of brain work, uh, incredibly smart guy. There's also the Peak Brain Institute in LA that does pre and post QEEGs and uses neurofeedback mm -hmm. to treat treat TBI and concussion issues. And they also work with people with ADD, ADHD, distractibility, sleep issues, et cetera. And I've done some podcasts with them as well. So it's the peak brain Institute in LA. Yeah. And the one of that is a huge one for TBI. Yeah. I, I figured you would probably mention it, but of course, since it's kind of my wheelhouse too, I would, I would definitely say that if you have a TBI, it doesn't matter if it's kind of a minor concussion or a major concussion. Neurofeedback is like a must. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, there, there is a, a clinic that I have not been to, but it's supposed to be one of the best ones in the U.S. I think they're located in Utah, uh, in, in Provo, Utah. They're called Cognitive FX, Cognitive FX, and they have something called their EPIC treatment, EPIC treatment. And what it involves is you go there for a week. It's a week-long program designed to treat post-concussion syndrome and post-concussion syndrome uh, symptoms. So they start off with what's called an FNCI scan, neck and brain MRI, and then they follow that up with a week of intensive therapy that's specific to the brain injury and the symptoms. So you're there for a whole week and they do a bunch of different treatments. They've got like occupational and sensory motor therapies. They've got physical exercises, neuromuscular rehabilitation, psychological support, you know, like the whole diet, supplementation, medical piece. Uh, their website is cognitivefxusa.com. Again, I haven't been there yet, but it is supposedly like the bee's knees when it comes to concussion treatments. And like if I had a concussion, I wanted to actually go to a clinic and have somebody oversee all of this for me. I would either go to Dr. Dan Engel's clinic in, in Boulder, or I would go to this uh, cognitive FX place in Provo, Utah. If you actually want yeah. to, you know, if you, if you had the money and wanted to fly and just like go spend a week completely healing your brain. So it looks pretty sweet. There is a whole stack of supplements from like curcumin and turmeric to uh, like a Chinese adaptogenic herb blend called Tian Chi, glutathione, taurine, creatine, high dose melatonin before bed, a lot of other supplements that have been shown to heal the brain as well. But we're getting a little long in the tooth. And uh, I took a ton of notes on on this whole protocol, and I'm just going to put them all. You can consider this to be like the complete protocol for concussion TBI. I'm going to put it all in the mm -hmm. show notes at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 402 if Mark or anybody else listening in wants to go and check that one out. So um, I'll put everything over there. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I, another thing to add to Boundless too, right? That's right. 
That's right. To the, to yeah. the, I actually have a lot in the Boundless book as well on the, on on just brain enhancement. You know, there are ten chapters on brain and mind enhancement as well in that book. Nice. So, so yeah, yeah. I'll say one thing. One thing that you kind of have mentioned, but I wanted to talk about because it, again, it kind of falls right in my wheelhouse. Is that when I see a lot of individuals with TBI, uh, there is just a lot of uh, emotional pain that is that, that comes secondary to having a concussion or having traumatic brain injury, and so a lot of people will kind of beat themselves down and kind of have this mentality that things will never get better. I'm never going to recover. But with the research that we have on brain neurogenesis and the ability for uh, impaired areas of the brain um, to to be either repaired or for other areas of the brain to take over the functioning of that area, um, it's pretty significant. And I think from the protocol that you've listed here, which again, I'm looking at the notes now, it is quite extensive. Um, And I think that people may look at this and think, I don't know how I'm going to do all this, but I think it is well worth giving most of this a try um, because you want to do the best, give your brain the best shot and best chance to heal itself um, because you only have one brain. So, so give it, give it your best go. Oh, they're like the kidneys. There are a couple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh You can get rid of one of those. You don't need both. I get my organs mixed up. Uh, But (laughs) anyways, what do you think? Should we, should we, should we give something away? Give, give some swag away away. to wrap this baby up. Let's wrap All that right. up. All right, so, man. Uh, so I, I got one um, here right. that I'm going to read to you. All right. from so this s- is the part of the show where Jay reads oh. a review. So if you go to Apple Podcasts and you leave your review, you can leave your review on, any, on anything, Overcast or Spotify or Pandora or wherever you listen to this podcast. But you, you leave your review. And if we read your review and we like it and we read it out loud on the show, we'll send you a whole swag bag. All you got to do is email gear at bengreenfieldfitness.com with your T-shirt size. So if, if you hear your review read on the show, you email gear at bengreenfieldfitness.com with your T-shirt size, and we're going to send you a swag bag. All right. Take it away, Jay. All right, man. So I've got one from Sam T1618 who titled his review or her review. I guess Sam could go both ways. Uh, inspiring. Five-star review. And Sam says, in high school, I used to tout my ability to eat copious amounts of junk. I did the same thing. This podcast has caused me to make a complete U-turn. Through the knowledge brought by Ben, I have been inspired to be a label reader and to eat natural. This podcast has helped me to feel better and be enthused to eat healthier. I'm not quite to the level of coffee enemas. You'll get there. Oh, he says it. But perhaps I'll get there. I think you will. It's just kind of a natural progression. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, coffee well, not, not to uh, not to rabbit hole too much because I know we got to wrap this thing up. But uh, the whole coffee enema thing, I know I catch a lot of flack for that, um, and you know people are people think I just like talk about coffee enemas or like do a coffee enema occasionally or even video <laughs> something on on Instagram to you know just generate attention and do something gross that that makes me stand out. But I actually yeah. do have genetically a high risk for colon cancer. And mm. for me, it actually is a preventive strategy. Like I do this to care and I've gotten two, I'm 37. I've gotten two colonoscopies already, you know, which are typically yeah. something you don't start till you're after 40 and I'm squeaky clean, squeaky clean, you know, no polyps, nothing yeah. at all. all and I attribute coffee. some of that to the fact that I've been doing, you know, several times per week, usually about three times a week, coffee enema for years. And, um, yeah. not only does it improve peristalsis and liver and gallbladder function, but it can decrease some of the risk for colon cancer. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's not just a shtick. It's actually a preventive method for me. So, right. so quick giving Ben a hard have, time, people. Yeah. Yeah. Quick giving me a hard time. Just taking care of myself, pay attention to my genetics, take care of my body. And, uh, the only th- thing I need to do now is sleep. So yeah. at some point today I'll make it happen. I have a, no I coffee up the a bum. guy knocking on my door in 10 minutes who wants to show me some brand new exercise device that he invented. And so I have to go exercise for the next hour. Then I'll, it sounds so appealing when you want to sleep. I know. So anyways, though, everybody, thank you so much for listening in. Leave your, your comments, your questions, your feedback. Uh, we'll jump in and reply to everything over at Ben Greenfield fitness.com slash four Oh two. We'll put the whole concussion protocol on there Everything else that we talked about, kettle and fire bone broth, all the studies, the metformin protocol or the metformin alternative protocol, all those studies I mentioned on meat, plants, everything over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 402. Jay, awesome talking to you, man. Good talking to you too, man. Go get some sleep after your four-hour workout. All right. 
Bye, everybody. <laughs> Peace. Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben Recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. Please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.